Good morning. Let's go ahead and start with prayer. Father God, as we come to you, as we are in your house, Father God, we, we know that we are in your presence. Even if we don't see you or, or necessarily feel your presence, Father God, we know by your word that you are here and we trust you. Father, I ask that you do great things in our lives today and help us to be open to you. Help us to grow and to learn and to, to know you better. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You know, I saw a shirt yesterday, and, and it, was, it was about the United States Constitution, and it, and it says, it doesn't need to be rewritten, it just needs to be reread. And I thought, you know, that's true about the Bible. It doesn't need to be reinterpreted, it just needs to be reread. And I think so many times um, in today's society and in today's modern church, um, we've got too many people that are trying to rewrite history and, and cancel history and reinterpret the Scripture instead of just going, thus saith the Lord, going back to what the Scripture says and, and living by that. Last week we looked at King of Kings, and this week I want to look at Lord of Lords. And, and I want you to... Kind of bear with me as we look at the sovereignty of God. Um, sovereignty can be a confusing issue. Uh, there are some that go to the point that because God is sovereign, that we have no choice, and, and we just kind of go along, and God just pushes us here and there, and um, it just is what it is because God made a decision, and then we have no say in it. And then there's others that just say God isn't sovereign. So as we look at Scripture today, I want to look at a couple of things and, and realize that in the sovereignty of God, He gives man free will. And, and even though sometimes that don't make sense to us, um, even in the book of Job, we see how Satan was able to do things, but God was still in control, giving him parameters of what he could and couldn't do. And as we, as we think of it today, I want you to look at um, all of Scripture, not just parts of it. Because we, we take some verses that we like, and then we cling to those, even though what we say about them disagrees with other Scriptures. So as we start with that, let's look at Psalms 139. This will make more sense and be a little bit more clear as we go. Famous passage, we've read this many times, um, when, when we think of the whole um, right to life and things like that, we always go to this verse. It, it says, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. And so we understand that, that there's, there's life at conception and God is doing this um, miraculous thing. Next verse you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Now, some interpret that to because God, see, God knows everything before it ever happens. And so it's recorded in his book. And so some interpret that to where I have no choices. God wrote it down how it was going to be, and I have no choices. It, it, I, I'm going to... I was born one day, and I'm going to die another day, and I have no choice in that. There, there's nothing I can do to change God's decision. Then why does God say over and over in the Bible, if you do this, then this will happen. But if you don't do this, then this will happen. Hmm? See, we can't take verses out of context. The context is God in his infinite eternal being knows everything from beginning to end all at the same time. And the idea of this passage isn't that God recorded your actions so that you couldn't change them. The context of this passage is God, you're so special to him. He knows every mistake you're going to make and every good and bad decision and he, he loves you so much, and you're so important to him, that he wrote it all down. He even wrote your choices down. Does that make sense? 
Well, we look at it in that context, it'll make more sense as we go through this study. But over and over in the Bible, uh, look at Deuteronomy 28. If you obey me, I will bless you. But if you don't obey me, then you'll have all these curses upon you, right? So that means you have a choice, correct? When you look at Romans chapter 1, it says, because people chose to push me away, because people chose not to accept me, then I handed them over to their evil desires. There was a choice there, right? So it says, every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Doesn't mean you don't have a choice. It just means he knew about it, and it was so wonderful to him. Picture this. How many of you, think about this. How many of you, you bought baby books when your kids were born? Now, now you're in church. You have to be honest. How many of you never completed them? Right? Right? You did really good to, like, kindergarten, first grade, and then it just kind of started filtering off. Now, how many How many you, you did, like, maybe second, third grade with the first kid? Second kid, birth, you know, first steps, first haircut, third kid, didn't even get a book. Right? Right? Come on. Come on. Now, but see, here's God. God, with every human being, they are so special to him, he bought the book, and, and he looked over through their whole life, and he filled it out completely, and, and, and when you enter heaven, the book is there, and it's complete. How cool is that? Look at the next, look at the next verse. Had to put this one in there. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God? The good, the bad, and the ugly. God still has precious thoughts about all of us. Is that cool? I like this. They are innumerable. God, I can't even count. How many of you have a really good friend, and, and, and if, if today you got a call that they were doing a surprise party for them today, and you had to give a speech and say nothing but good things about them, you'd be going like, I like their hair. I've known them a long time. Right? Right? And, and, yet, and yet God says to all of us imperfect people that he loves us so much that he has all these innumerable great thoughts about us. How does that make your day? That's really cool. That's, that's called grace. You with me on that? In 1 Samuel chapter 13, listen to the words that are coming out of God's mouth. Listen to what it says. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have disobeyed the command of the Lord your God. Okay, we, we've read this, but notice what it says. Had you obeyed, what's another way to say that? If you had done the right thing, if you had done what God told you, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. So wait a minute. Did something change in Saul's life because of his choices? Now, think about what that says. That says that if Saul had been obedient, God would have established his kingdom forever, which is what he's going to next do to the man after his own heart, David, correct? Now, notice that Bible did not say, listen, Saul, God picked you. So that he could mess with you. And, and your life was doomed to failure from the beginning. God is sovereign and you never had a choice. Didn't say that, did it? It says, Saul, you're foolish. You had a choice and you made the wrong one. If you had made the right one. Now think about us. 
How many things do you think in life could have gone way better for us if we had have made God's choice and been obedient instead of being foolish and disobedient? See, this is why a lot of people like to say, you know what, there's nothing I can do. You know, God's got it all recorded, and he's calling the shots. I have no choice. Because we don't want to accept the fact that we're responsible. Do you realize that if you abuse your body all your life, God will let you reap the consequences of that? No, no, that can't be because God wrote it all down. What does the Bible say? Over and over and over and over again, we have choices. And, and the prophet of God said to the king, your, your lineage could have gone forever. But because you disobeyed, because you were rebellious, right? But now, because you've been foolish and disobedient, now your dynasty, it has to end. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And Saul, you weren't that. Saul was in it for himself. The Lord has already chosen him to be king over his people. For you have not obeyed the Lord's command. Okay, so notice God didn't take him out of the picture right away. God says, I've already chosen him. But there's going to be this transition. All right. So as we look at this, in 1 Samuel 15, 22, it says, Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? He doesn't want us to pull the 1 John 1, 9 card. He just wants us to do the right thing so that we don't have to pull the 1 John 1, 9 card. It's still there when we need it, but that shouldn't be. There's too many people saying, I can do whatever I want because all i got to do is pull the 1 John 1, 9 and it's okay. How, how many of you have ever joked about this? Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. Well, I don't know. I think we're on really, really scary territory when we're choosing to do that. But the idea is this. God says, listen, I, I don't want you to have to apologize. I just want you to do the right thing. Make sense? Obedience. Obedience is far better than sacrifice. Listening to him is much better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as bad as the sin of witchcraft. Now think about it. In, in, in the Old Testament law that we've already gone through, what was the penalty for witchcraft? Ooh. See, some of us are like, you know, I'm just being rebellious. It's not a big deal. God will forgive me eventually, and it's okay. He forgave the prodigal, and I've got time. But, but no, come on. Every one of us here, I bet, knows at least one or two Christians or professing Christians that are living that way. But he says rebellion is just as bad as witchcraft, which deserves death. So we shouldn't brag about our rebellion. We shouldn't, you know, like rest in our rebellion. We should be kind of scared about our rebellion. And then it notice the other one is stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. What was God's uh, viewpoint on worshiping idols? Not good. So because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Not because God foreordained it to have to happen, but because, Saul, you chose to reject him. Now he's rejecting you. Make, make sense? If you, if you read John chapter 3, it says if you accept Jesus and, and there's, there's no judgment waiting, but if you reject him, there's judgment rate waiting. You've already been judged because what? You rejected Right? First Samuel 16. So as David stood there among his brothers. Now, now you remember this. We've got we to kind of do a little bit of a backpedal on this. Well, what happens? He comes to anoint the new king. And, and it, it, it went through the whole family. Jesse, do you have anybody else? No? No? 
oh, oh, yeah, wait a minute, yeah, yeah, I got one more, but, you know, he's he's a stinky shepherd, he, he's out there in the field, well, you better get him, because none of these are it, right, so this is, this, think about this, this is David, who was forgotten, he, he wasn't even invited to the party, So as he stood there amongst his brothers, still stinking like the sheep, Samuel took the olive oil he had brought and poured it on David's head. That was the anointing. That was the touch of God. It says, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him from that day on. And then Saul or Samuel returned to Ramah. And so we see David is anointed as king. But he wasn't in the office of king yet. The calling was upon him. The anointing, the Holy Spirit was upon him. But he wasn't installed as king yet. That's an important factor. Now let's go to chapter 16. Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. And the Lord, the Lord, once the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul... The Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Now, it's interesting here. Holy Spirit left, and then God sent an evil spirit to torment him. Now, this shows you the sovereignty of God. Well, God could never do anything bad to us. Read the Bible. What about, what about Paul's thorn in the flesh? That was given him to humble him. Now, let's make some clarity here. The tormenting spirit filled him with depression and fear. Now, what should he have done? Repented. Sought the Lord. Now, now, listen, if we take the whole of Scripture, what is God's goal? Is God's goal just to mess with Saul? Or is God's goal to always restore? Restore and redeem, right? His mercies are new every day. Listen to me. Saul lost the kingship. God rejected him as king. But I do not believe God rejected him as a human being. Because think about it, if God had rejected him as a human being, why mess with him at all? The idea was, okay, listen, you've had the Holy Spirit, and you've had the blessings, and you've rejected me. So now, I'm going to put this spirit on you. So you gotta, you got to understand that God even controls the demons. God controls the bad people as he chooses to, right? Within parameters, just like we see that with Job. Now, now listen to me. Saul could have said, Lord, this is too much for me. Spare me. Redeem me. But he didn't. Anybody know anybody like that? God does everything possible, and instead of repenting, they seem to go further and further away from God. Think about it. In, in, in the rest of Paul's life, we see him trying to kill David, whom, whom he admitted was going to be king. We, 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 see, we see him going to a, a witch to have a seance, we don't see him going to the Lord. And so as we, as we look at this, I want you to look at this story. God was in control. And so one, God had placed his spirit upon David. He had taken his spirit, his anointing, off of Saul. He puts a, an evil spirit into Saul's life. Not to destroy him, but to get his attention. And it didn't work. So verse 15 says, some of Saul's servants suggested a remedy. I like this. 
It's clear to us, Saul. It's clear that a spirit from God is tormenting you. So now what do you do? Now, this is why you've got to be careful who you hang with. Right? Because not everybody is going to tell you the right thing to do. Uh, now, they had the clarity to know God's doing this to you, Saul. But what did they say? Let us find a good musician. Saul, when you start feeling depressed, man, you crank up the stereo and, and you just you pound the music. Doesn't matter if the, if the neighbors complain because music soothes the savage beast, right? Notice, notice what they said. They, they said, now, Saul, let us get a, a good musician to play the harp. See, they had it specifically set up. They could have thought of other instruments, but they said to play the harp. Whenever the spirit is tormenting you, this person will play the harp for you, and the music will quiet you, and soon you'll be well again. Now, uh, think about this. Saul, God is doing this to you. Don't you think they should have said, you need to go to God? God is doing this to you, so we're going to find a way to take care of it. How many people do you know God is doing stuff in their life to get their intention, so they just take some more pills. They just smoke some more dope. They just drink some more alcohol. They don't go to God to fix the problem. They don't do anything to fix the problem. They just mask the problem. How many of you, how many of you it's like that when you go to the doctor? They don't figure out what the problem is. They just give you medicine to mask the problem. Right? Nothing against doctors. They're, they're practicing medicine. But seriously, and, and we, we need doctors. We, we need the medical profession. But it's a great illustration. Because our human response is, let's mask the problem. Does that make sense? The, the, the thing is, is they should have said, dude, we need to get the priest. When you have a, a sickness or an illness, what were you supposed to do? You go to the priest. When, when God's against you, you should go to the priest. Have the priest pray over you, intercede for you. But they didn't do that. Let's just play some music. How many of us have done that? You know, we, we, you have a, you're having a really bad day, so you get in the car and you crank that music up. You, you blow the speakers because it drowns out all that noise. You turn up the, ra the radio or the TV. You go to bed, you can't sleep. What do you do? You turn the TV up because it at least drowns out your thoughts. Notice, notice what verse 17. All right, Saul said. Find me someone who plays well and bring him here. Okay, find me someone. Verse 18, one of the servants said to Saul, The son of Jesse is a talented harp player. Who, th who do you think put that into this guy's mind? His own family forgot him. All right? His own family left him out in the field, but some... Guy in the palace knew right away there's the son of Jesse who plays really well. He is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is brave and strong and has good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man because all those things are really important to play music, right? You notice everything they're saying is external. Everything. Oh, and by the way, the Lord's with him. 
Now, this is where it kind of gets confusing. Because how many of you, when you've been fighting the Lord, you don't want somebody with the Lord coming around you? So Saul sent a messenger to Jesse to say, send me your son David, the shepherd. That's interesting. You see how God's got everything in line. Because, see, David knew how to be a shepherd. Did he know how to be a king? He, he had probably never been near the palace, let alone in the palace. So how, how was God going to train him how to be a king? Get him in the palace. You think about it, you, you take a shepherd and you, and, you, and you throw him into the palace, is he going to know the protocols? Is, is he going to know how to dress and how to act and how to be royal? Is he going to know how to lead? No. Now listen, I don't want to get into a huge political thing here, but, but what, what was one of the biggest problems with Trump? He wasn't a politician. So what did he do? He made all the politicians mad because there's protocol, right? Think about it. You take a shepherd and you put him in the palace. He's going to need some training. What better training than to observe and watch somebody in action? And, and, and think about this. It's a whole lot easier to watch and observe and learn when you're not on the spot, right? And you, poor, poor Ron's back there this morning. He's, he's trying to learn all the stuff he has to do next week by himself. And the whole time, I'm standing there going, come on, you got to get this. Come on, you got to get this. It's all on you next week. It's a lot harder that way than when you're just sitting there watching. There's no pressure. Dude's playing music going, huh, huh. And God's, I'm sure, saying, did you see what just happened? Remember that. Right? Because isn't that how God did with Moses? Throw him into the palace as a kid, raise him in the best schools, and then get his attention out in the desert being a shepherd and say, now i got a job for you. Isn't it cool how God has everything in line? And so Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with the young goat and the donkey loaded down with food and wine. So David went to Saul and served him. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of Saul's armor bearers. Oh, wait a minute. Besides playing music in the palace, he's also right with Saul in the army. God's got a plan, because as a king, he also had to be a warrior. God's training him. So God's disciplining Saul with this evil spirit, and he's raising up David with his spirit. Perfect plan. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, asking, please let David join my staff, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp, and then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. Chapter 17. Famous story. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between um, Soka in Judah and Zika in Ephesus Damim. Saul countered by gathering his troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. And then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was a giant of a man measuring over nine feet tall. Made Saul look short. He wore a bronze helmet and a, and a coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leggings, and he slung a bronze javelin over his back. Huge behemoth of a guy. The shaft of his spear was as heavy, as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. 
An armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a huge shield. Goliath stood and shouted across the Israelites, Do you need a whole army to settle this? We don't need to have everybody fight. This guy is so cocky and so confident. He's like, just bring out your best man and we'll settle this. Man to man. Choose someone to fight for you and I will represent the Philistines. We will settle this dispute in single combat. Fight to the finish. If your man is able to kill me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you'll be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel. Send a man. Send me a man who will fight with me. When Saul and his Israelite, the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. The Spirit of the Lord wasn't on Saul. He was leading an army without God. But God was still in it, wasn't he? Chapter 17, verse 17. One day Jesse said to David, Take this half bushel of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread to your brothers and give these ten cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring me back a letter from them. Doesn't that sound kind of like Joseph? Go check on your brothers for me. Bring me back a report. How many are saying that never goes well? David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. But they weren't really fighting. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the guests. He arrived at the outskirts of the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelites and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his, left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, he saw Goliath, the champion from Gath, come out from the Philistine ranks, shouting his challenge to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. They're standing there, army to army, and they're okay. And this one guy over nine feet tall walks out, and the whole army turns around and runs. Don't you think there would have been at least, like, nine or ten guys that could have attacked this one guy and probably won? I mean, you know, seriously... The whole army couldn't have been a bunch of pansies. They were soldiers. But see, I think God had a lot to do with this. Because his spirit wasn't upon them. And they didn't feel the strength that they felt in the past. And their leader wasn't empowered by God. So the whole army ran away. It's interesting how the Israelites ran. What would normally ha happen in a battle? The opposing army would chase them down and shoot them in the back. Duh. Right? I mean, every one of us knows that. But wait a minute. That didn't happen. Because God was still on the throne. Right? Lord of lords. God of gods. Now think about it. It says, have you seen the giant, the men were asking? He comes out each day to challenge Israel. And have you heard about the huge reward the king has offered to anyone who kills him? The king will give him one of his daughters for a wife, and his whole family will be exempted from paying taxes. Huge thing. All these soldiers are, are talking to David about that. You'd think at least one of them would have considered taking up the offer. But instead, they're talking to a teenager. How can you not see God in all of this? David talked to some others standing there to verify the report. Is that true? Is that true? What will a man get for killing this Philistine and putting an end to his abuse of Israel? 
Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Wait a minute. Perspective all of a sudden changed. Who is this pagan coming against God's people? You see, David put it back in the Lord's court. Huh? How many times do we not do that? Put it back in the Lord's court. Do you belong to God? Why did he get silent? Are you sure? If you belong to God, then Satan shouldn't have a right to defy you. Are you a king's kid or not? See, David put it in perspective. You're not just messing with ordinary people here. You're messing with the Lord's people here. What if that's how we pray? What if, what if, what if that's how we acted and responded? I have rights. I'm an American. But you know what? As a Christian, you have even more rights. Because you belong to the Lord. Why is he allowed? Come on. There's nobody here that's going to oppose this guy. You're allowing him to get away with this. Somebody's got to stand up. What was it in Isaiah? Who will go? Who will I send? Verse 32, don't worry about a thing, David told Saul. So David... He's an armor bearer, and he's a harp player, and he's a shepherd. So he's not, he doesn't have a claim to fame at this point. And he's standing here with the king. Don't worry, king. Can you imagine? As we know the pride of Saul, can you imagine how much God had to do to keep from Saul from standing in his arrogance and just shooting down David? Think about it. I'll go fight this Philistine. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, think about it. What David is saying, I'll fight this Philistine, and if the Philistine wins, all you guys are going to be his slaves. But I'll go fight him. Military guy is going to go like, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not wise. So Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way that you can go against this Philistine. You're only a boy. And he's been in the army since he was a boy. David, this can't happen. How many of you have ever been told, you can't do this? Too dumb, too smart, too ugly, too good looking, too short, too fat, too tall. There's always a reason that people can throw at you that you can't do something. Right? Saul says, man, there's just no way. There is no way. But think about David. He knows the way. Because with God, there's always a way. David persisted. See, David didn't shrink back. David, okay, fine, Saul. I can't serve in the church because the pastor doesn't like me. No, listen, Saul. I've been taking care of my father's sheep. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it. Did you see that? He didn't say I hide behind a rock and throw a, a, a bottle at him. He says, when that bear or that lion comes, you know, that reality is it could kill David while David's trying to save that lamb. And David says, I chase it down. I go after it with a club and I take it. I take the lamb from its mouth. And if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. So 
Saul, this guy is no different than a lion or a bear. I'm going to chase him down. Now wait, now wait, wait, because you got to think about David. He's a man after God's own heart, right? I have done this to both lions and bears, and I will do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. I'm going to do it for the Lord. Right? Notice what verse 37 says. This sums it all up. The Lord, the Lord of lords, the Lord who saved me from the claws of the lion and the bear, whom I chased down and beat to death. It was the Lord that gave me the ability to do that. Notice he wasn't saying, Saul, I'm something. He's saying, Saul, we serve the Lord here. And the same Lord that gave me victory then will give me victory now. You see that? So Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. And may the Lord be with you. May the Lord be with you. And then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. He wasn't trained in them. I can't go in these, he protested. I'm not used to them. So he took them off. He took them off again, and he said, you know what? I'm going to do it with what I'm trained in. See, see, too many people try and do it like the sons of Sceva, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. That didn't turn out so well. They weren't trained in the Jesus that Paul preaches. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. And then armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, and those five stones, he started across to fight Goliath. Now, now, there's all kinds, you can read all kinds of sermons and studies about those five stones. Some will tell you that there's five stones because Goliath had four brothers. We don't know. Let me give you my assessment why I think there was five stones. Number one, David was humble enough to know one stone may not be enough. Number two, David was in it to win it. And if it took five stones, he was going to use five stones. You know, we, we, we read the story, and some of us watched that movie about the ten virgins, right? And five of them were prepared to go all the way until the Lord returned, and five of them ran out. I want you to know David was in it to the end. He was going to do whatever it took to finish strong in the Lord. And I believe he took five stones because whether there was five brothers, four brothers, or whether all five were needed for Goliath, he was going to be prepared to win. You with me on that? Too many Christians start out and then months later they're like, no, I can't do this. I'm going to go back to my old life. Notice, he started towards Goliath. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? Big old guy, got a spear, got a sword, got a, got a shield, got his armor bearer. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David shouted in reply. He didn't say, don't, don't talk to me like that. Stop mocking me. You come to me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty. 
We're not playing games here. I brought God. Huh? How much bigger is God than Goliath? The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He's on my side. So this battle is me and him against you. Today, notice what he says, today the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. What if we had some Davids today? What if we had some Davids today? I'm going to church, and if there's nobody else spirit-filled, I'm bringing the spirit with me. And they're going to know that there's a God in Silver Lakes today. What if, what, was, what if that was our attitude every day? And everyone will know that the Lord does not need weapons to rescue his people. It's his battle, not ours. You realize the battle that you're in belongs to the Lord. If we get out of the way and let him fight it for us. The Lord will give you to us. And notice, notice verse 48, man. This is awesome. This is amazing. David is standing there telling the giant this. The giant moved closer to attack, and David quickly ran out to meet him. David didn't wait. He ran to the problem. He ran to the giant, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it from his sling, hit the Philistine in the forehead. On a run, with a moving target, uh, granted it was a big target, but how many of you couldn't hit the broadside of a barn if it was standing still? Hit him in the forehead. The stone sank in to his forehead. It didn't just bounce off. And Goliath stumbled and fell face downward to the ground. What a picture. So David triumphed over the Philistine giant with only a stone and a sling. And since he had no sword, right, all he had was a sling and a shepherd's staff, he ran over and he pulled Goliath's big old sword from its sheath. And David used it to kill the giant and cut off his head. Exactly what he said he would do because of the Lord. Must have been really difficult to lift that sword. But he did it. He followed through. He didn't just take him as a prisoner. He didn't just wound him and beat him up. He put an end to the defiance. You get that? Chapter 18, verses 5 through 9, a little time later. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. Isn't that what we read in Psalm chapter 1? It is the light on the Lord. So Saul made him a commander in his army. Now, wait a minute. He got a promotion. So now he's been in the palace. He's learning how to be a king. He's learning how to be a leader. And now he's a commander in the army. You see how God is progressing with David's life, preparing him for the moment that he's going to be king. Now, notice what it says. This was an appointment to commander that was applauded by the fighting men and officers alike. Wait a minute. David is getting popularity amongst the army. You think that's going to be important when he becomes king? But something happened when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed Goliath. After he, after he woke up on Goliath, they're returning home, and women, they're coming out from all the towns along the way to celebrate 
and cheer for King Saul, and they sang and they danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. So they're, they're celebrating Saul, and they've got this song. This was their song. Saul has killed his dad. And you know Saul's up there going, you're right, you've killed thousands of men. But David, his tens of thousands of men. It doesn't matter how skewed the facts are. Notice the popularity is shifting from Saul to David. Now we just saw that the army are applauding his being exalted. And now the people are like, yeah, David. He has surpassed Saul ten times over. Wait a minute, this made Saul very angry. What's this? They credit David with tens of thousands and me with only thousands? Next they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. And he tried to kill David many times. And David was on the run because of Saul. Notice what it says in chapter 24, verse 1. After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 special troops from throughout Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. So Saul's going to kill David. He takes 3,000 men. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it just happened, see, you've got to look at the providence of God because it didn't just happen. God had David in that cave. David and his men were hiding in that very cave where Saul went to relieve himself. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Kill him, David, kill him, David. Now's your opportunity. You can be king. Today is the day the Lord was talking about when he said, I will certainly put Saul into your power or do with you to do with you as you wish. And then David crept forward and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. They're in this dark cave, and he's able to cut off his part of his robe without him knowing about it. But then David's conscience began bothering him. You notice a man after God's own heart. And he, and, he, and he said, the Lord knows I shouldn't have done this. It's a serious thing to attack the, Lord, the Lord's anointed one. Did you catch that? Wait a minute, time out. Isn't David the anointed one? But God hadn't taken Saul out of the picture yet. And so then even though David had the anointing of God, even though, even though David was empowered by God, David, listen to me, had respect for the position and the person in the position and he was not going to do God's job. Did you catch that? I, I, can go, I can go on to prove this. For the Lord himself has chosen him. So David sharply rebuked his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king! He didn't say, Hey, stupid! He was still respectful. He was still respectful. And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. And, and you've got to have confidence in the Lord to bow low before a guy and 3,000 men that are trying to kill you. But he said, my Lord, the king. Because David, wait a minute, 
respect and authority. How many times have we studied about respecting authority? You know, the bottom line is the, the guy that had his child healed, he said, Lord, I'm a man of authority, and I'm under authority, and I understand that you're the authority. Right? And then he shouted to Saul, why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you? Why do you listen to the wrong people? I'm not out to get you. This very day, you can see with your own eyes, it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did his man tell him? This is what God meant when he said, I'm placing the king into your power and you can do whatever you want. See, God was placing him in his power, but he didn't want him to kill him. See, sometimes we go too far. You with me on that? Back there in the cave, some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm him. He's the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father. You see the respect? The customary respect. Now think about it. It's a piece of your own robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I'm not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you've been hunting for me to kill me. Wouldn't it have been self-defense? I mean, come on, you could claim that. He was out to kill him. He brought 3,000 men to kill him. But David didn't claim self-defense. He said, listen, this proves I'm not out to get you. David was trying to make peace. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Didn't the Bible tell us that in the New Testament? Listen, listen. The Lord will decide between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you are trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. Listen, if the Lord is going to get you, that's fine. I'm not going to do it. Vengeance belongs to to the Lord, never take vengeance, right? As the old proverb says, from evil people come evil deeds. So you can be sure that I will never harm you because I'm not evil. Who is the king of Israel trying to catch anyways? Should he spend his time chasing one who is as worthless as a dead dog or a flea? You see the humility of David. Say, man, I'm nothing. Why are you chasing a, no, a nobody, a nothing? Why are you wasting your time? You've got the Philistines out there. Deal with them. I'm not your enemy. Chapter 24. And now I realize that you are surely going to be king, and Israel will flourish under your rule. That's Saul talking to David. Now swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family and destroy my line of descendants. So David promised, and Saul went home. But David and his men went back to their stronghold. Chapter 26. Now some messengers from Ziph came back to Saul at Gebeah to tell him, David is hiding on the hill of Hakalah, which overlooks um, Jeshimon. So Saul took 3,000 of his best troops and went to hunt him down. <laughs> you know, you, you got to look at Saul because the guy's never repentant. He says, yeah, God's going to make you king. Israel's going to flourish. I'm at peace. I'm not going to kill you. And then a little bit later, now I'm going to kill you. Lip service, right? So Saul took his 3,000 men. Saul camped along the road beside the hill of Hakalah near Jeshimon where David was hiding. But David knew of Saul's arrival, so he sent out spies to watch his movements. So David knew what was going on. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. Saul and his general, Abner, son of Ner, were sleeping inside of ring formed by the slumbering warriors. So you got the general and the king 
and they're surrounded by all these warriors so that nobody can get to the king unless going through the warriors. That was a strategic military decision. So David says, will anyone volunteer to go in there with me? David asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai, son of Zerui, uh, Joab's brother. I'll go with you, Abishai replied. So David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Abner and the warriors were lying asleep around him. I know weird that there was no lookout, but you got to remember God's in control of this. And remember, besides that ring, there was, there was a total of 3,000 of the best warriors, right? So this wasn't like he was just going up on eight guys. God has surely handed your enemy over to you this time, Abishai whispered to David. Let me thrust that spear through him. I'll pin him to the ground, and I won't need to strike twice. It's going to be once and done. No, David said, don't kill him. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed? Did you see David, a man after God's own heart? Who can be innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed. Surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday, or he will die in battle, or of old age. But you see David's, see David's point? Saul's going to die someday, and then I'll be king. And it may happen in battle. The Lord may just strike him down. It may happen in his sleep at old age. But the Lord forbid that I should kill the one that he's anointed. You see David's heart? You see his attitude? But I'll tell you what. We'll take his spear and his jug of water, and then we'll get out of here. You got to really appreciate David. It's like, sneak in. Take his sword that is in the ground right next to his head. Take his jug of water and take off. Not make a commotion. Not kill him. Not capture him. Just take two important things and run. So David took the spear and the jug of water that were near Saul's head. And then he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing them or even waking up. Wait a minute. Because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. Who was in charge of all of this? See, see you've got to look at the providence of God. God still had Saul in control. Do you realize the integrity lessons? That God was instilling in David? The authority lessons that God was instilling in David? So that when God put David on the throne, he would truly be a man after his God, God's own heart. And then his line would last forever. And the Messiah came through David's line. Just as God promised. Is God in control? See, it's hard. It's hard. You can't think that God was only in control then, but he's not now. If he's the Lord of Lords, he's always been the Lord of Lords, and he'll always be the Lord of Lords, and he's always going to be in control. Now, does he let us do a lot of stupid things? Free will is a part of it. But see, think about it. He chose to give us free will. It's not like we make free will on our own. He chose to put that into the parameters. It's just like, you know, you think about it, football teams. There are some teams that the coach gives the play, and they have to run that play no matter what happens on the field, no matter what they see or do, they have to run that play exactly the way the coach said. But then there are other coaches. They teach and they train and then they give that quarterback liberty to make decisions. 
See, see, God put in the parameters giving us liberty to make decisions. They're not all good ones. But God has a fix for that too, right? David climbed the hill opposite the camp until he was at a safe distance. And then he shouted down to Abner and Saul, Wake up, Abner! Wake up, sleepyhead! Well, Abner... Abner, you're a great man, aren't you? David taunted. Where in all Israel is there anyone as mighty as the great Abner? So Abner, tell me this. Why haven't you guarded your master, the king, when someone came to kill him? Who came to kill him? David, this isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord that you and your men deserve to die because you failed to protect your master, the Lord's anointed. Abner, you and those tough guys, you deserve death because you didn't protect your Lord, the anointed one of Israel. Look around, Abner, and I'm sure he'd already been doing this. Look around, Abner, where are the king's spear and the jug of water that were beside his head? Saul recognized David's voice and called out, is that you, my son, David? And David replied, yes, my lord, the king, still respectful. Some of us have been going like, yeah, stupid, it's me. Look what I got, looky, looky. David said, yes, my lord, my king. Why are you chasing me? What have I done? What is my crime? Isn't this the same thing David went through last time? But now let my lord, the king, listen to his servant. If the lord has stirred you up against me, then let him accept my offering. But if this is simply a human scheme, then may those involved be cursed by the Lord. For you have driven me from my home, so I can no longer live among the Lord's people and worship as I should. Must I die on a foreign soil, far from the presence of the Lord? Why has the king of Israel come out to search for a single flea again? See, he's humble. Why does he hunt me down like a partridge on the mountains? And then Saul confessed, I have sinned. Come back home, my son. And I will no longer try. Hadn't he heard this before? Bite me once, shame on you. Bite me twice, shame on me. I'll no longer try to harm you, for you, you valued my life today. I have been a fool and very, very wrong. And notice he's saying this in front of his soldiers who were asleep. Here is your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you, even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. You see how the man of God's own heart responds? Do you, do you see that? Pretty powerful stuff. Now may the Lord value my life even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. And Saul said to David, Blessings on you, my son David. You will do heroic deeds and be a great conqueror. And then David went away and Saul returned home. So David did just say, Okay, king, let's go. He was still wise. But you notice... He left trying to make peace. And he left respecting. He did the right thing, not because he wanted to, because guess what? You know what? He probably wanted to kill the king. No, you ain't going to stab him through. I'm going to do it, right? But he said, no, this is the Lord's anointed one. And he did the right thing because it was the right thing. 
Let's learn lessons and know that God is Lord of Lords and he's in control. And we may not see it. And we may still see idiot kings like Saul in control. But that doesn't mean God's not working in our lives and in our situations. God is still on the throne. And we can trust him. Let's choose to trust him. Father God Almighty, we just thank you and praise you for your word. Father God, I thank you that in your sovereignty, you give us free will. You give us the will and the ability to choose you. Father God, you give us the opportunity and you redeem us. Father God, help us not to be like Saul. When you're coming after us, Father God, help us to repent. Father, we know that you are always in the redemptive mode. You are always there to redeem and restore. Father God, help us as a people to live by grace. Father, we trust you and we thank you and we ask that you would truly be Lord over our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Is that good?